<coughs> of course, uh, of course, uh, <coughs> I give my thanks to Claudia Rittenberg for her presentation, to Mary Bryson for the invitation, and to the Cen Center for Cross-Faculty Inquiry, to all the co-sponsors of this talk, and to the Consulate of France, and of course to all to all of you. Well, the title of my the title of my work requires a preliminary explanation. I'm certainly not the first person who suggests that there is something wrong today with the tradition of critical thinking. Many contemporary authors have declared that its time was over. According to them, there would be nothing left for criticism since criticism implies a denunciation of a bright appearance concealing a solid and dark reality, but there would be no more any solid reality <clears throat> to oppose to the appearance and no darkness to oppose to affluent society. I'm not willing to lend my voice to that tune. Instead, I would like to restate the case and suggest that the concepts and procedures that defined a certain critical tradition have not vanished, but they still work, be it in the very discourse of those who made fun of it. But they do it in a way that implies an entire reversal of their supposed ends and orientation, so that it is only by taking into account the persistence of the framework and the reversal of its functioning that we can hope to engage in a true critique of the critique, I think. So I'll focus on some contemporary manifestations in the fields of, of theory, politics, and art we, that reveal a significant shift in the procedures of presentation and demonstration associated with the tradition of critical thinking. I'll borrow my starting point from the art world by focusing on the evolution of an artistic procedure that was for a long time emblematic of critical art, the procedure of collage. I don't understand collage as a technical device, but as an aesthetic procedure which consists in playing on the clash of heterogeneous, if not contradictory, elements. But aesthetics was implemented in the time of surrealism as a means of exploring the reality of bourgeois everyday life and disclosing the deeper reality of desire, dream, and the unconscious. Then it was taken up by Marxist artists, notably under the form of photomontage, as a means of showing the realities of violence and exploitation underpinning the false appearances of peaceful democracy. Among the artists who used it in that way, Martha Rosler made at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s a well-known series, Bringing War Home, by pasting images of the war in Vietnam on images of American petit bourgeois or bourgeois interviews. For instance, in this collage called Amputee, or in this other one called Balloons. I apologize, I apologize for the images, you know, I, I, got, it for, I got it just from the net, you know, and I had, I had to el, 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 enlarge them so, so they look ugly, but well, I think it, it, it is not exactly, you know, about the, the, the artistic quality of the, of the images, you know, my talk. Well, so that, 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 uh, that image, it's called Balloons, organized a clash between the balloons, you know, situated near the door, which probably belonged to the children of an apparently wealthy family, and the bullets that struck the dead Vietnamese child carried by his father. The image worked as a twofold demonstration of causality. The young cripple or the dead child were the truth hidden by the cozy interior, the reality of imperialist violence allowing for happy American family life. This revelation of the secret beyond the door was emblematized by an other image showing a woman opening the curtain on the reality of imperialist war. This is the image. But the other way around, happy American family life was staged as the cause of the indifference towards the violence of imperialism. So on the one hand, the image said, this is, you can get back for instance, this is a hidden reality that you cannot see. You have to be aware of it and behave according to that knowledge. But 
There is no evidence that the awareness of a situation brings about the determination to change it. This is why the image told something more. It said, this is the obvious reality that you don't want to see because you know that you are responsible for it. In such a way, the political effect expected from the image was a combination of knowledge of the hidden reality and guilt about the denied reality. Let us focus now on some works of an artist who similarly deals today with the relation between violence and consumption. Let us look at some of the installations made by the German-born and New York-based artist Josephine McZaper. They consist so in little in little showcases <coughs> that put together that put together things that don't go together. For instance, here in this installation called called Selling Out, a display of fashion items and a book on a, on a British group of urban guerrillas, the Angry Brigade, who precisely in the 70s wanted to bring war home. Or here, a communist poster near to a mannequin for feminine lingerie. Or here, the well-known slogan of May 68 in France, ne travaillez jamais, never work on bottles of perfume. <laughs> the struggle of the collage is the same as that of Martha Rosler's series. It puts together things which apparently don't go together to show us that they actually go together since they are part of the same process. Now, in the case of Martha Rosler, the collage opened up on the demonstration of an incompatibility between two words, the image of the dead child could not, go, could not go with the image of the pretty interior without exploding it. On the contrary, Mexipa's collage is predicated on the homogeneity of the elements. The forms of political radicalism and even the action of the urban guerrillas are staged as a phenomenon of youth fashion. The, it is no more the conflict, which is the truth of the commodity, but the commoditization, which is staged as the truth of the conflict. This reversal could be epitomized by a photograph that, unfortunately, I could not get. So you have to imagine it. Well, Josephine McSepper makes several uh, series of, of photographs of protests, and notably of the protests against the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. One of his photographs shows us protesters holding banners in the background. But in the foreground, we see an overfilled garbage, garbage can, the content of which falls to the ground. So once more, we are presented with the connection between imperialist war and, cons and consumption, domestic consumption. The anti-war protest brings war home. But it brings it in a space where it is at home, in a space of struggle that is itself a territory of consumption. Presumably, the cans and packages that overfill the bin have been thrown there by the protesters themselves. So bringing war home in this case doesn't mean anymore being aware of the remote reality of imperialist war in the heart of American happiness. It means the contrary, being aware that the war is present here only as a motto on a banner, in the middle of a reality which is the reality of American consumption, so that ultimately the protest itself appears to belong to an homogeneous process of consumptions of commodities, images, and spectacles. So at first sight, we must draw the conclusion that the logic of the critical dispositive of collage has been entirely self-cancelled. There is no hidden reality to unveil, no feeling of guilt to arouse. But if it were so, why keep a dispositive that has no more any relevance? This is why my assumption is, is, is quite different.